This video is the next in my quest to try hardware IP blocks on the FPGA on the Tang Nano 9K FPGA development board. This time, I'll demonstrate how to instantiate and use the FPGA's block SRAM memory. I'll show how to instantiate this memory both by Verilog inference and directly. I'll use an I2C connection between a Raspberry Pi and the FPGA to command SRAM memory accesses. The Goen GW1NR9 FPGA on the Tang Nano 9K provides 26 18 kilobit block SRAMs. They can be configured in various ways. We'll use single port mode and combine 8 BSRAM blocks into a single 8 bit wide 16 kilobyte SRAM. Note that there are limits to how many blocks can be combined by the toolchain. We're talking about the kind of SRAM that has a clock. The figure shows the inputs and outputs. The Verilog describes the behavior of a simple SRAM. To read, drive the address lines and set write enable low. Then, after the clock rising edge, the data out signals will have the desired values. To write, drive the address and input data signals and set write enable high. On the rising edge of the clock, the input data will be stored into the SRAM. Setup and hold times apply. A cool thing about Verilog on FPGAs is that you can use Verilog, like that shown here, and the tools infer from it how to allocate and configure block SRAMs to give the behavior the Verilog describes. The process is called inference. You have to read the manual for your FPGA to know what will work and what won't. This Verilog actually works on the Tang Nano 9K, but it may not be the best. We'll see different choices later. A Raspberry Pi sends data to the FPGA to be written to the block SRAM, and receives data read via an I2C bus. You can see the connections and pins used here. There is an I2C target on the FPGA. I'll put a link to my video on that topic below. Look at that video to fully understand the I2C communications. Here's a picture of the test setup. You can see it's very simple. Just two signals in the ground go from the Raspberry Pi to the Tang Nano 9K. The I2C target in this demonstration implements four registers. Registers 0 and 1 hold the SRAM address to read from or write to. Register 2 holds the data to write to the SRAM. As we'll see, the Raspberry Pi writing to this register is what sets the write-enable signal and triggers a write to the SRAM. Register 3 shows the value read from memory at the address in registers 0 and 1. So, to read data from the block SRAM, the Raspberry Pi writes the address to register 0 and 1, and then reads register 3. To write to the memory, the Raspberry Pi writes the address to register 0 and 1, and then writes the value to be stored to the memory in register 2. We'll see how this works in the Verilog later. It's quite simple. Now, let's take a look at the system in action. Then we'll dive into the Verilog. Here we are in the Gowan IDE. We'll take a look at the Verilog later, but for now, we'll just go to uh, process. I'm actually going to say rerun all here and rebuild everything. That'll take a minute because my computer is slow. And everything's complete. So now we'll program, and I'm on Ubuntu 22.04 here. And so I'm going to program using my, my script um, load mem that I've shown you before. So we'll program into SRAM of the FPGA. Now let's switch to the Raspberry Pi. And as before, I've written a test program that can do the reads and writes, but I also have some scripts here. I want to show you those. So this little script, rd, uses i2c set and i2c get to send the i2c commands that cause the FPGA SRAM to be read. And then similarly, we have wr to, to do the write. So I could use these scripts like wr and give the the address high high part, so I'll just make that one. The address low part, I'll make that zero and the value to right. Let's make it one one. And then I can read that with RD and same address. And we can see that we read back uh, hex one one. So so that worked. Now this uh, C program is a little bit more advanced. And so I can do reads and writes and, and also do a test where I read and write the entire SRAM. I'm not going to go into details on the source of this because it's very similar to the C program in my r squared C target video. So once again, see a link below for that, but we'll just run it. So we can do, for example, a minus W in here. The, I can give the full address. I don't have to split it into, into individual registers. So I could write to, let's say, 3001. And I'll write a value there of 11. 
and I can write I can do another write on the command line here and say let's write to 2000 and I make that 22 and then I could read both so minus x 3001 minus r um, 0x2000 and we can see that I read back what I wrote so the program's working the test mode of, of this program um, first first writes sort of randomish values to all of the locations in in the SRAM of the FPGA and then it reads them all back checking to see that what it wrote is what it read so we'll let this run it takes a little while so the test is complete with no errors and that's uh, that did take a little bit of time but we we did write and then read uh, 16k bytes of the SRAM so the next thing to do is to dive into the Verilog in the Gowan IDE, let's first take a look at the top-level module. And this one actually has nothing to do with the BSRAM. It's all hidden farther down. But it defines the pins that are leaving the FPGA. So as the clock, we're using the 27 megahertz CAN oscillator that's on the Tang Nano 9K itself. And then these two pins just go to the Raspberry Pi. They're as described in my video about I2C, about the I2C target. So see that. And I think that's all we need to say about the top level module. Next, let's look at the BSRAM module. And this is the one that contains the definition of the BSRAM. And you'll see we actually have three different ways of instantiating the, the SRAM here. But first, the signals that are leaving the SRAM in all three uh, instantiations are these. So we have the clock, which is the 27 megahertz clock. Uh, coming from the oscillator. We have a reset, which we're not actually using. I, I just tie that low all the time. It's active high. And then there's the signal CE that Gowan documents as being called clock enable. And I don't know whether they really mean to say chip enable, but but they're, uh, they're a little unclear about what exactly that does. But it has to be high while the uh, SRAM is changing state, that's for sure. And this is the write enable signal, and then the uh, address for reads and writes, and data in for writes, and data out for reads. Those are the signals. The first implementation of the SRAM is, is this one I'm calling generic. And this is the one from the slide at the beginning of this video. And it's very simple, and, um, and it works. But notice that it's, it's, just, it's using an assign so that data out is always reading directly what comes from the memory. That's kind of the defining characteristic of this one, that, that and the fact that it pays no attention to the CE signal. But like I said, it, it works. And also notice that I'm using conditional compilation to select which of these instantiations gets used. So if I define generic, this one gets used. If I define from doc, this next one will be used. This next one is called from doc because it comes literally from the Goin documentation. They give this as an example of Verilog that will be inferred to use the block SRAMs. And so how does it differ than the previous one? One, one of the changes is that it uses a register to hold the data output value. So when, when you do a read, which is shown here, the value in the memory is just placed into this register and it's the register itself that is assigned to the output signal. So that actually causes an extra clock for the output to appear. But on the other hand, you're not connected directly to the memory. The other difference is that the CE signal is being used. And I guess that gives us a clue to what it's supposed to mean, because this is from the Gowan documentation. And really, all it's doing is, is preventing state changes if, it's, if the CE signal is not high. So. It's a, more like a chip enable, I guess, but, but in any case, I think it has nothing to do with, with tri-state outputs. I decided to call this last method of instantiating an SRAM direct because you're doing it directly. You're not writing Verilog that the toolchain has to infer. It doesn't have to make an inference from it to decide that it should turn into some usage of, of block SRAMs. Instead, you say exactly what you want, and you do that through the Goen IDE, as I'll show you in a moment. But it gives you kind of this pattern to paste into your program in order to instantiate an SRAM. And the signals are the same as we've been using above, except there's an additional one called OCE. And Goen documents that as being output clock enable. But again, I'm 
not sure that that's the best name for it. I think all it does is gate whether or not the output register changes state. So I don't think it has anything to do with tri-state. And I'm not really using that signal in any meaningful way, so I just I just set it to be high all of the time um, so that the output is always enabled. And this works just as well as the other two in the I squared C integration. To generate one of these, you use tools, IP core generator, and memory, expand that, expand block memory, and double click on sig single port. And it brings up this configuration GUI. So you can set address steps to what you want, 16.384 for us. Uh, and data width 8. There are some other options that I won't talk about. They change the semantics of the memory a little bit. And then you can say calculate, and it shows the resource usage. So eight of the block SRAMs are used by this. And then if you say OK, it asks me if I want to overwrite the file I already have. I guess I can. I'll say yes. Do I want to add the generated files to the current project? That may cause some confusion because there's there's some already there, but I'll say yes, see what happens. And then it gives you this pattern to paste. And so that's what I did. I copied that and put it into block SRAM like that. And then one thing I'll mention is that when I did this previously, the hierarchy got confused and it didn't think the top level module was the top level module anymore. And so maybe that's happened again. Where is the top level module? Oh, here it is. It looks like it didn't happen this time, but the way that I fixed it is I selected this and said, set as top module. So let's see if this still builds and, and uh, let's see, will it think it needs to build? Yes, so build all. And this takes a while, but I'll bet it's gonna finish. So anyway, that's how you um, instantiate a uh, NSRAM directly. And it worked as expected. So how does this get integrated with the I squared C target? To see that, we have to look at file register interface dot V, and this is one of the files that comes with the I2C target. And the changes to it are not too extensive. We have this wire data from RAM that's going to be used to connect the output of the SRAM to the register that gets sent to the Raspberry Pi on an I squared C read. And we also have to define a register um, write enable which is initialized to zero, so we don't immediately start writing. And this syntax here is where the memory actually gets gets instantiated. That previous file was just describing what got instantiated. This actually does it. So we're connecting the 27 megahertz clock directly. We're just holding reset to be inactive, uh, setting it to zero all of the time. And, and the CE signal is active all the time, set it to one. And then we're passing through the write enable and then here the address is formed by the concatenation of the first six bits of register zero, I squared C register zero, and then all eight bits of I squared C register one. Data in comes from I squared, C, I squared C register two. And then data out is connected to this wire that we defined below, which is now conveniently highlighted down here as well. So when we do a read, the, that signal is what is providing the data to the data out register that then gets sent out the I squared C bus. So that's how reads work. And so that's very simple. Um, writes are just a little bit more complicated. Um, what happens here is that registers uh, 0, 1, and 3 just, just get written as I squared C registers. And register 2 is special. So its value is captured just the same as all of the others but we set write enable to one, and that's going to trigger the, the write to take effect in, in the SRAM. But we don't want to hold that high forever. So what we do is on the very next clock, we set it back to zero. So it's just being latched in the subsequent clock. So that's all there is to this, this integration. I think it's remarkably simple. I remain quite happy with this I squared C target as a piece of test infrastructure. It's a nice way to be able to control the FPGA when you're testing other things like the SRAMs. We've seen how to instantiate and use Gowan block SRAMs both directly and by inference. See below for links to source code and other information. I'll end the video here. Thanks for watching.